Hi everybody, I'm Ian Cunningham from Vets GB. Welcome to this episode of Engineering the Jigsaw, foundation episode number 11, all about how the jigsaw is evolving. In this episode, we're picking up previously in Engineering the Jigsaw, in episode F10, we looked at how vehicle EE systems evolved to include multiple networks, multiple ECUs, and multiple network technologies. Hopefully this picture you see now is familiar to you. If it is not, if you're not sure how we got to this kind of picture, please, please consider going and watching episode F10 and watch that before we continue to understand how we got from the cars of the 1880s, the vehicles of the 1880s to around 2010 or, or so. In this episode, we're going to cover the last 10 years and the next 10 years. We're going to do a bit of prediction. And this means that you're going to benefit from having seen our other foundation level episodes and in particular, episode F8, what is an HCP or HPC, as we're going to introduce one into our simplified vehicle E system and as we look into the future. So we left off Previously, we just introduced Ethernet into our vehicle for diagnostics and maybe a couple of other specialist use cases within infotainment, maybe in an ADAS system. As we develop a hybrid vehicle, though, we need to transfer even more data in the mid to late 2010s. And eventually we reached a point where the flex ray and multiple CAN buses that we have in our vehicle up to now are insufficient. And so we introduce automotive Ethernet or AE for short and our gateway that we had previously is now a multi-layer switch. We also, alongside this, we're going to aggregate some functions that were previous on individual ECUs onto larger execution platforms called functional domain controllers. And we're going to connect these via automotive Ethernet to Ethernet switches like so. So we have what's now called an Ethernet backbone. In fact, this is a cascaded switch architecture. It is a more technical way to talk about because we have a number of switches to give us a number of Ethernet connections we want to have. We then have functional domain controllers for chassis, hybrid, infotainment, and body systems. So we have a chassis functional domain controller, for example. And because we've integrated functions or moved functions from ECUs to remove some ECUs from the vehicle, it is only some, it's, it's not lots of ECUs. We may still, when we build up our whole picture, still have nearly 100 ECUs in this kind of scenario in the, in the mid to late 2010s. Because we've moved functions to the, the domain controllers, our functional domain controllers, so our chassis domain controller maybe, this will have wires running between it and sensors, actuators, and of course, networks to other ECUs. So let's imagine we decide to take our ESC functionality and put that on the chassis domain controller. That means it will have wires going to every wheel in the car, for example. And also, of course, it will connect to the rest of the chassis system. So we still have our chassis flex ray that we talked about previously, and the ECUs are connected to that. And for hybrid, we have our engine management system and maybe a transmission controller, transmission ECU, alongside our electrification can where we have our battery management system, our charger, our traction motor control that we need to have a hybrid vehicle. Our entertainment system kind of speaks for itself. This is our fancy touchscreen where we want to have lots of animations and stuff going on. And our body functional domain controller. Well, this hooks up to our switches via body LIN. We maybe have our smart actuators. Uh, so things like window motors, maybe windscreen or wiper motors are actually connected via LIN, so we don't have to have lots of individual wires. Other ECUs, seat ECUs perhaps, door ECUs, may also be connected to our body functional domain controller via CAN. Other functional domain controllers I've left out of the picture again to keep it simple. Alongside everything we've done here, we can also introduce a connectivity ECU that permits us to begin over the air software updates. Here it is. So we have an ethernet backbone and an offboard data link. And this is a really modern picture. You can 
buy a lot of cars nowadays that are similar to this under the under the hood and other vehicles as well are starting to move this way as, as well. And right now today is where we can introduce potentially an HCP. So following the introduction of automotive ethernet, if we introduce service oriented communications to our functional domain controllers, we can bring in our HCP that runs the adaptive, Autozar adaptive platform, where our functional domain controllers and other ECUs are running the Autozar classic platform. So here we have that picture of high performance computing platform with adaptive working side by side with ECUs running the Autosar Classic platform. And our functional domain controllers get a special role in this. They are linking between the signal orientated worlds of CanLin and FlexRay and the service orientated communication of Autosar Adaptive. And our connectivity link then gives us the ability to do some really nice and advanced things. So our HCP that we introduced to run the infotainment can also host other applications such as predictive traction control. So what's predictive traction control? Well, predictive traction control is where an offboard system dynamically updates our HCP with data on locations where wheel slip might occur. And this means our HCP can request the hybrid and chassis domains to take action before a wheel spins. So we've gone from a reactive system where we had to detect a wheel spinning to now a proactive predictive system. This is enabled by the HCP every time our vehicle or another vehicle for the HCP in that vehicle, having a, a loss of traction, the HCP in that vehicle reports that along with the location of the vehicle to a back-end computer, the back-end computer then maintains and refreshes a list of locations where loss of traction may occur and it provides that to the HCPs within the vehicle fleet. So this is really based on that connectivity function. And this is, as I said, quite modern really, really modern. It's today in the next few years, potentially even. If we look a little bit beyond this though, well, the disadvantage that we had with that picture is we still had a lot of wires running from some of our ECUs or functional domain controllers all around the vehicle. So our chassis domain controller, for example, because we put all our ESC functions on it, had wires running to each wheel and all the other sensors used in the ESC system. Also, the body functional domain controller would have had wires to each light cluster, so the, the front the headlamps, the rear the tail lamps, all the indicators, lights in the roof, lights in the doors, maybe bits of the doors as well, so sensors for locking and um, latching and opening windows potentially. Lots of wires and fixed functions that are difficult to change because we have dedicated hardware performing specific individual functions. To address this, we can divide a vehicle into topological zones and give each of them a zone domain controller or ZDC with buses to IO nodes that gather inputs and provide outputs in a very few ECUs. So let's build this into our picture. To try to simplify things a little bit, I've put one of the switches inside our HCP. This is also something that can happen in a vehicle nowadays, uh, not necessarily tied to the mid 2020s that we talk about. So we bring in our zone domain controllers, one just for the sake of argument in each corner of the vehicle. Other possibilities are to have maybe one in the back and two in the front or six or however many you want. We then link them up to our switches using Ethernet. So that part, the Ethernet backbone that we had with functional domain controllers with zone domain controllers looks roughly similar. We then though have IO nodes that are gathering our inputs and providing outputs and just a very few ECUs. And we just keep ECUs when we need dedicated hardware for a specialist task, such as electric vehicle motor control or maybe image recognition in a camera uh, radar, LIDAR, these kind of things for autonomy systems. So for example, we may have motor controllers in the front and the back, or maybe more realistically, one in each corner for each wheel for our electric vehicle, which we are now in the process of looking at. So we have an electric vehicle. All of our functions that we had previously concentrated in individual domains are now spread across the vehicle. So our zone domain controllers will be maybe 
performing some calculations based on data across the Ethernet backbone to provide the electronic stability control function and also the traction control functions. This means that with I.O. nodes for gathering data and uh, doing uh, providing outputs, we, we take a lot of wiring out the vehicle. Also, we have a lot more flexibility. We have more generic hardware. We have commodity hardware for our high performance computing platform, our zone domain controllers and our I.O. nodes. And this enables us also to move towards a software defined vehicle. And just to quickly uh, try to give a little hint to what's where HCP is still the adaptive platform. IO nodes will be the what's our classic platform. Zone domain controllers could be one, could be the other. And in this picture, we've kept CAN. Um, there's a bit of a, a technology war in process. So CAN is being respecified to provide the capability to have larger frames with faster data rates and Ethernet is being respecified to reduce cost as well and run at a lower speed. So they these two kind of versions, there's CAN XL, there's 10 megabit per second Ethernet, they are really competing in, in the market for future vehicles to, to use them. And once we have all this kind of stuff in place, our software defined vehicle becomes a possibility. We need a reliable data link to off-board computing resources. And this means that the vehicle may become part of the Internet of Things or IoT, which you may have heard of. And over time, more and more vehicle functions may be executed off board in the cloud, to use the jargon. So our predictive traction control function is just one example of something that may happen off board. Many other things may start to happen off board. And if this comes to fruition, if the use of flexible off-board computing with a data link to generic onboard hardware, such as HCP, ZDCs and IO nodes, really becomes common, then we can achieve software-defined vehicles. And when what this means is that vehicle functions may continue to change and grow even after vehicles are produced. So if we've got dedicated hardware providing relatively fixed functions, we don't have the ability to really add lots of changes after we've built a vehicle or change a lot of things or add new stuff. If we've got generic hardware, we have more flexibility, more capability potentially after we've built a vehicle. And this means that vehicle manufacturers may start to focus much, much more on the delivery of software to distinguish their products from competitors. As a summary, over time, Vehicle EE systems have become much, much more software orientated and the changes obviously have been relatively gradual. Up to the late 1980s, there was really no software in vehicles at all. And now in kind of 20 something years, there's been a real functional explosion, lots of software, and we can only see the pace is likely to increase right now. They are accelerating the vehicle networks we have are really the enablers for this in particular automotive ethernet which unlocks lots of new capabilities and permits vehicles to operate in completely new ways there is the potential for vehicles that are produced in around five years time to be radically different to the vehicles being produced today some people say that the vehicles we'll be buying in, in maybe five years time will be as different to the vehicles we buy today are to horses and carts so such a huge change in the, the kind of thing that we'll be buying and what it's able to do the potential of zone domain controllers hcps and io nodes is therefore to fundamentally change how vehicles are designed developed and maintained and also it may completely change the relationship between the vehicle manufacturers or oems and their suppliers over to a commodity purchase model rather than buying dedicated fixed function hardware we may also see the first software defined vehicles coming onto the road around us so really really exciting time to be in the industry lots of potential let's see where it goes this is clearly a rapidly evolving topic and there are loads of technical articles and webinars available for free on the vector website if you want to get the latest picture on all of this we also have free e-learning on the AutoZar Classic platform and Automotive Ethernet if you want to learn more about those enabling technologies. If you go to our website, you can find details of our data-centric engineering platform for the design and analysis of software-defined vehicles along with their communications with off-board computers. This is in Prevision. 
We have embedded software to match the AutoZar Classic and Adaptive Platform specifications. So Classic MicroZar, Adaptive MicroZar. And of course, we have tools for testing software, HCPs, functional domain controllers, zone domain controllers, and IO nodes, together with software-defined vehicles themselves. So Canoe and Canuva software. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode. It's a, a lot more predictive than most of our episodes are. Normally we talk about things that are or, or maybe even have happened. If you've got any questions, any comments, please let us know. Get active in the comments. Or if you found this video, please send us an email to our special email address, engineering.jigsaw at vector.com. Make sure to hit the bell on our YouTube channel to get notified of our next episode when that goes live. I'm in Cunningham from Vector GB. Thank you very much for joining us.